Good evening, everybody. It's uh, Ewan Hook speaking here from Sydney uh, and bringing to you the 24th uh, live cast from The Real Review. And uh, we welcome you. And we know that there's quite a lot of people who've signed up uh, to watch this evening. Um, and we know that some of you have got bottles in front of you. I hope all of you have got a bottle in front of you. And hopefully it's a Brosson bottle because the Barossa Valley is our theme for this evening. And uh, whatever you have in front of you, we hope you've got something so that you can have a sip as I'm sipping. And uh, with any luck, you've got at least one of the wines that we're going to taste this evening. As usual, we're tasting eight wines and uh, all Barossa, of course. And just for the purposes of this, we're talking about the Barossa Valley itself, not Eden Valley. Um, as you're probably aware, the Barossa, without the word valley after it, indicates a zone. The Barossa zone includes two valleys, the Barossa Valley and the Eden Valley. The Eden Valley is the high country right beside the Barossa Valley, which just happens to very luckily be, have a cooler climate and be very good for growing white grapes, such as Riesling. So a lot of the Barossa wineries source their Riesling from the Eden Valley. Uh, we're not tasting any Eden Valley tonight. We're tasting all Barossa floor wines. Um, we're starting off with a couple of whites. Um, the Barossa, of course, is 60, 62% Shiraz, would you believe? Out of It's 90% red grapes, the Barossa Valley. Uh, when I started off in the wine industry like 35, 38 years ago, um, I'm sure there was a lot more white grapes planted in the Barossa than there are now, but they have become much more of a specialist in red wines in the Barossa because that's frankly what the place is, is the most suited to. And okay, 90% red grapes and 62% of all the grapes in the Barossa are Shiraz. This is an astonishing figure, I think. Um, only 13% Cabernet, 6% Grenache, et cetera. So all of the other varieties are in small amounts. Um, other than Cabernet, they're all less than 10% of the total plantings. Um, I think that's growing, of course, because the Barossa is not just good for Shiraz, Cabernet, Shiraz, Grenache and Mulvedra, which are the Rhone Valley varieties, but all of the southern French varieties, what we call the Mediterranean varieties, uh, which are warm, dry climate varieties, including uh, Spanish varieties such as Tempranillo, uh, Graciano, uh, and also Italian varieties from the southern, perhaps mostly from the southern half of Italy, grapes such as Sangiovese, um, Fiano, Vermentino, um, and Nero Davila, which is becoming a bit of a darling of the wine industry in general, and deservedly so in recent time. The Barossa is really quite a beautiful area. I love going to the Barossa. It's one of my favourite regions in Australia. Um, it is the most famous. I think it's by com common agreement. It's the most famous, most recognised wine region in Australia. And if you think that South Australia is nicknamed the wine state, because it is frankly 52%, I think, of the wine industry is based in South Australia. The heart, the beating heart of the South Australian wine industry has to surely be the Barossa Valley. It's where a lot of the great names of Australian wine originated, names such as Seppelt and Henschke and the Hillsmiths of Yolumba and the Gramps of Orlando uh, and, and many, many others. Um, the Barossa also makes a claim to being the, um, to having the longest unbroken line or lineage of wine growing and winemaking families in Australia. And uh, they, they date back now to the seventh generation are often in, in, in command in a lot of these vineyards and wineries of the Barossa. So they do have a very, very interesting history. The history, of course, is partly Germanic and partly English. Um, the uh, German-speaking Silesians who established or who settled in the Barossa in the 1840s, um, uh, a lot of them had mixed farms and included in their mixed farms were vineyards. And a lot of those people still have descendants who are growing grapes and making wine today. And of course, the other half of the question is the, uh, is the English settlers who went up to places like Angerston, the Hillsmiths, of course, the Salters who established Saltram, people like that, uh, they also had a vineyard put into the development of the Barossa in the early days. These days, of course, it's, um, it, it still has that Germanic feel about it, uh, in addition to all of the other 
um, um, cultures that are mixed into this uh, interesting melting pot, which is the Barossa Valley. We're going to have two whites and then two blends, GSM blends. So these are loosely termed the Rhone Valley blends, Grenache Shiraz Multaro in varying proportions, which is a real specialty of the Barossa. And then four Shirazes of different styles, um, all from different makers. And of course, that's the heart of what the Barossa does. But we're going to start off with um, the turkey flat. But before I do that, I will say, please, if you have any questions or arguments or discussions you'd like to put online or to put to me specifically, there's a question and answer section that you can uh, easily ask your questions. And we invite you to do that anytime. And I'll, after each two, two wines, I'll taste them in two at a time and then have two questions in between uh, the brackets of two. So please do that. So moving on to the first wine, which is Turkey Flat Vineyards Barossa Valley White. I was talking about Riesling in the Eden Valley and how 62% of the Barossa is Shiraz and 90% of the Barossa is red grapes. I think there's been a trend in, certainly in my lifetime, away from the varieties that don't suit the Barossa, such as Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and even Chardonnay, I think, doesn't really suit the Barossa towards the Mediterranean white grapes. So Fiano and Vermentino I've already mentioned. There are many others. Um, the Southern Rhone varieties, Marsan and Roussan, are obviously two of those that really do suit the Barossa very, very well. And this is a blend of those two varieties. So Turkey Flat 2019 um, Barossa Valley White. And I'm pretty sure that this is the same wine that used to be called the butcher's block. So they had a butcher's block red and a butcher's block white at Turkey Flat because Turkey Flat used to be actually a butchery and the old butchery is still there today. And the butcher's block, which is a great big lump of red gum, I think, which they used to chop the meat up on, is still there in the cellar door. You can see it today. So, and it's very old. Um, so that's, I think, a really good, one of the really good trends is towards moving uh, each region in Australia, not just the Barossa, but moving towards the varieties that suit that region and that climate better. And what was traditionally planted there wasn't necessarily the best thing, but people are becoming more and more aware of what is the best thing for their region. Marsan and Roussan, definitely two good varieties for the Barossa. So Turkey Flat, um, I've mentioned uh, the Butcher's Block. They're in the Bethany region. So just, just, just south of Tananda is a little village called Bethany, one of the first settlements of uh, white settlement in the Barossa. Uh, the Turkey Flat Vineyard was one of the oldest in the Barossa. It was established at Bethany in 1847, which <laughs> is the same year that Johann Gramp uh, from Orlando started um, Orlando and later Jacobs Creek, of course. Um, and the same year that uh, Gilbert, established Pusey Vale up in the Eden Valley. So 1847 was, you know, pretty early, pretty early. And the original Turkey Flat Vineyard was planted then. The guy who planted it was uh, a guy called Fiedler, and he planted 72 varieties, would you believe? He must have been a really interesting fellow. Two of those varieties, interestingly enough, were Marsan and Roussan, and they've been grown there ever since. So Mr. Fiedler didn't stay there for very long before he sold the property to the, the Schultz family and the Schultz family still own it. And that year that he sold, it was 18, in the 1860s. I'm not sure exactly which year, but in the 1860s. So it's been owned by the Schultzes since the 1860s, which is uh, pretty, pretty interesting history. Um, moving to the wine itself, this is the 2019 vintage, Marsan Roussan, um, good colour, youthful. Uh, the first thing you notice about this is the smokiness of the nose. It's got an extraordinary bouquet. Um, it's like matchstick, struck matchstick, burnt matchstick. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sulfide, a type of sulfide, and it's almost so strong in this wine, it's almost like an electrical fire, if you can imagine what an electrical short smells like. Not exactly a good wine descriptor, but that sort of character is becoming more and more common in Chardonnays these days. It, for a long time, it's been common in Burgundy Chardonnays from France. Um, Australian Chardonnays are very 
often have this character now, especially New Zealand Chardonnays, actually. Um, a lot of people would smell it and say, oh, that's a bit pooey. There's something wrong with that. But I would encourage them to look further because this is actually a very complex wine. Let's have a... It really is dominated by that character, which some people might term minerally, because um, if you imagine the smell of struck flint, if you knock two pieces of flint together or any, even granite will give you an interesting smell if you strike them together, two pieces together. That's the sort of thing you get. It's an interesting smell. And there is fruit there as well. But let's try the palate. Hmm. Put the bottle there. Um, wow, that wine has a lot of impact. It's got a great intensity of flavour, terrific acidity. The acidity in that is, um, I think it's a bit higher than it normally is in this year, but it really is refreshing. It's um, crisp and energising and uh, lively. It will really carry food flavours well. Um, I think it would go great with seafood, um, but poultry as well, for sure. So there's a lot of savouriness in this wine. It's not so much a fruity wine, although there is definitely lemon and citrus type flavours buried deep in that palate. But it's really quite savoury and, and, and it's much more than just simple grapey fruit type flavours and aromas. It's a really interesting wine. It's a wine that you can sit and, and ponder on for a while. It doesn't bore you quickly. I really like that. But I can find that a lot of people, I would imagine, a lot of people would smell that and think, no, that puts me off. But I would suggest you should persist with it a little longer. And really, and there's some, that's a very good wine. $25. I mean, that, that's a good value wine. Mm. I'm really looking out for something um, to eat with that sort of wine. Um, we rated that wine 92 out of 100, and we said drink it from 2021 to 2026. In other words, five years. It'll go on for longer than that. I, I have a problem. I have no problem in suggesting that will last for uh, 10 years. No problem. Um, it got a silver ribbon at 92 out of 100. Um, that's a really good value wine. We asked the winemaker, Mark Bullman, what he would pair with that wine, and he said char-grilled sardines on a richly buttered toasted bread. On, on, in other words, toasted bread with a lot of butter on it. I agree with that. I think anything with butter in it would go really well with this wine. But sardines would certainly dominate that dish, and that would be lovely. So excellent stuff. Um, I'd be very interested to see the next vintage, which um, has just arrived in my tasting room, to see whether they're going to continue that style in the future because it's, um, it's a slight departure, I think, from the usual turkey flat uh, dry white style. But I do like it very much indeed. Moving on to number two, which is the Peter Lehman Margaret. Peter Lehman Margaret is... Um, Peter Lehman Winery is no longer owned by Peter Lehman and his friends, of course. It's now part of the Casella Family Wines Group, who, own, who are putting together a really interesting portfolio of high-quality Australian wineries. So Casella Wines is much more than Yellowtail, put it that way. They have Brands Lera in the Coonawarra and uh, Bailey's and Morris's in Victoria, um, as well as Peter Lehman. So Peter Lehman Wines doesn't have it great long history, of course. It was established by Peter Lehman, who uh, only died a few years ago. Uh, he was born in 1930. Um, and he, um, he worked he, firstly at Yolumba and then at Saltram. So he became quite a famous winemaker during those years. Um, and there was a period there where he, um, uh, I think, uh, decided to uh, set up his own business because a lot of the wineries in the Barossa were not buying grapes from the growers with whom they had handshake contracts that went back a long time. He was upset about that. He decided that they, he should establish almost like a cooperative, but not really a cooperative, a business where he could take in their grapes and pay them for their grapes when he, when he could. And that was the beginning of Peter Lehman Wines. 
in, I think, 1979. Masterson, it was called originally, and then Peter Lehman Wines. The winery is down on the Parra River, just outside Tanunda. And uh, his house, he built, he and Margaret, his wife, built their house on the land near the winery. Peter is no longer with us, unfortunately, but Margaret still is still there and still lives in the house. And he named this wine after her because she loved Semyon. And what better reason? Uh, she also likes sher sherry, I, I seem to remember, dry sherry. Um, so this is an interesting wine from many points of view because uh, Semyon has been grown in the Barossa for a very long time, but they used to pick the grapes very ripe and make quite a big, slightly blousy, some, sometimes quite oaky wine from it, which wasn't very Moorish. But when Andrew Wigan was the chief winemaker, and he no longer is, he's retired some years ago, but when Andrew was the, the chief winemaker, he looked at what was happening with Semyon in the Hunter Valley and said, I wonder if we could make that style of Semyon in the Barossa by picking the grapes really early. So he started making that style by picking the grapes early, using no wood whatsoever, uh, and going for a low alcohol, crisp, high natural acidity style of wine. And this was the result. The corollary is it needs a bit of age to, to develop into the great wine that it is. And this is now eight years old, 2013, Peter Lehman, Margaret Semyon. 2013 is the current vintage. So they release it as a mature wine or a semi-mature wine. And a lot of people have trouble telling this wine apart from traditional Hunter Semyon. And I'd have to put up my hand and say I'm one of them. Um, it's not easy. It's, it's a quite a similar style. The, the grapes come from the Barossa Valley floor. So it's not the high country where the Riesling is grown. This comes from the Barossa floor. But in, they make the wine by picking grapes early. It's only 10% alcohol, this wine, which is probably lower than most Hunter Valley Semyons. So that's why it's so crisp and vital and refreshing and youthful. That's an eight-year-old wine. It looks like two-year-old wine. It's so, so youthful to look at and to smell and to taste. Uh, lemons and toast and herbal characters. Really quite a lovely fragrant nose, really quite a complex fragrant nose. And part of the complexity, of course, is being contributed by bottle age. It's now developing some characters on the nose. Lovely, lovely wine. Let's have a taste. Wow, that is a wine that really makes you sit up and take notice. High acid, crisp, low alcohol, incredibly refreshing and vital. The vibrancy in, in that wine is something special. Um, low alcohol, and yet it has intensity and length of flavor. So alcohol is not always what you need to have intensity or persistence of flavor. This is a remarkable wine. It's bone dry. It's not been aged in wood at all. People that taste these wines for the first time often say, oh, hmm, what sort of wood did they use and how long was it in oak? But no, it's no wood at all. It's the toastiness comes from bottle age, not from wood. So it is the most, I reckon Semyon like that is one of the great food wines of the world. And it's our gift to the world because there's no other country that makes dry Semyon like that. Beautiful wine indeed. We scored at 93 out of 100 and we, uh, uh, we said um, drink it from now until 2030. Well, it's only another nine years, but it will go longer than that. But that'll be, uh, that's a good window to consider, a good drinking window to consider. Uh, it's a $35 wine. I mean, eight years old and $35, that's a real bargain, I think. It was rated number 27 out of 84 semions from across the country in 2013, which is not a bad effort when you consider the hunter is involved in that as well. Um, and when we asked the winemaker what he would like to serve with it. Nigel Westblade is the chief winemaker today. He said pan-seared scallops, good idea. Baked snapper, even better idea. Or roast chicken, pretty good too. But I think I put my money on the on the snapper. I think the snapper would be perfect with this. That is a very very stunning smart semillon, and I really really love it. And I think that that's the sort of wine that um, when I go out to a BYA restaurant, I usually stick a bottle of Hunter Semyon or a bottle of Semyon like that in my bag 
because it goes with so many different types of food. It's great. So a couple of questions. We've got um, Charlotte Pickering says, how long you can keep, can you keep semi on for? Well, definitely uh, it's now eight years old, but it's going to live a lot longer than that. It's still young, this wine. It's still young and fresh. I think it's less than halfway through its lifespan. So doubling eight years is 16 years, but 20 years, I would say, wouldn't be a problem for this wine. It does depend on your cellaring conditions. You've got to sell a wine under reasonably cool conditions, uh, and then you'll be surprised at how long it can age. Larry Harold says, uh, what causes the sulfitic reductive nose of the turkey flat? Ah, complicated. You've asked a difficult question there. Sometimes sulfides come during the fermentation of their own accord without any provocation. They're sometimes caused by a lack of nutrients to the yeasts in the fermentation. Um, in that case, it's probably accidental. But some people actually um, like to um, uh, keep a bit of this sulfide in their wine deliberately because they think it adds to the complexity, and I think it does too. Um, some of it can come from the vineyard. In other words, if you if you spray sulfur on your vines, which is a, you know, a, a fungicide, which is used in most vineyards, uh, if you if you spray a bit of that not too far before the grapes are harvested, there can be a little bit of residual sulfur still on the grapes when they go into the fermenter, and the yeast will reduce the sulfur to, to hydrogen sulfide, and that's how some of it can be caused. So there are, there are several ways this can happen, but um, I haven't asked the turkey flat people whether that was deliberate or accidental, but I think it's an interesting wine, very interesting wine. Um, I might save John Foster's comment for later because it's a long question and we're supposed to have only two questions per break. So hang about John and I'll answer that in a minute. So we're moving on to red now. So I'll get my plum red wine glass. That one. We've got two wines here that involve Grenache, which is, to my mind, the second most interesting red variety in the Barossa after Shiraz. The first one we're looking at is Dandelion Vineyards. <clears throat> and you can see that little, um, the TikTok I used to call them when I was a kid. Um, in the Barossa, they apparently called wishing clocks. So that's the dried out uh, seed pot of the, of the dandelion. Uh, which they've turned into the feature on their label. And um, it's part of the slightly fairy tale like story that they spin about their wines at Dandelion Vineyards. Um, the wines are all very, very good indeed. They're all made by Eleanor Brooks, who is a, a seriously competent winemaker who happens to be married to a chap called Zar Brooks, who, um, who is the I guess he's the, uh, the the marketing guy at Dandelion Vineyards. Dandelion Vineyards is a syndicate of which the Brookses are part. There are other people involved in it as well. Um, and I'm not sure how much vineyard they own, if any, but they do take grapes from various regions of Australia to make their wines, including, I think, Eden Valley, Barossa, uh, Adelaide Hills, um, McLaren Vale, and even Coonawarra. And I might have missed one or two. But they take grapes from various different places and the, the wines are always very good. But this, this particular one, which is called Menagerie of the Barossa uh, 2019, is one of their, their top, um, I think it's probably their top uh, wine of that style. It's only a $30 wine. Their wines do go up higher than that in price. But the interesting thing about the name is the menagerie of the Barossa. Zara Brooks is a well-known market around the wine industry and has been for, I don't know, at least 20 years, 25 years. And he has some, he comes up with some really interesting names and concepts for wines. He also writes quite verbose and entertaining back labels. And as you can see, there's quite a bit to read there. If you ever find yourself stuck in a restaurant by yourself, no one to talk to, and you forgot your phone, uh, you can read the back labels of Zars bottles and be very entertained. Um, and this wine is a GSM, a Grenache Shiraz Mataro blend. Some people refer to Mataro as Mulvedra, same grape. 
Pranashras Mataro is what they call it, a GSM, if you want to shorten it. And um, he calls it the menagerie of the Barossa because it's a menagerie of grape varieties. In other words, a, a collection of grape varieties blended together. A menagerie, of course, is, a, is actually a collection of animals, like a zoo. Uh, but hey, we're not going to quibble over that. So the wine is really, really good. Let's have a taste. First thing you notice, very deep and very youthful colour, beautiful, bright, red, purple, really purple on the meniscus, which is a sign of a youthful wine. It's only two years old, 2019. Very spicy, beautiful nose. Wow, fragrant. Lots and lots of different spices in there. You name a spice out of the spice cupboard and you'll probably find it. There's definitely pepper. There's definitely cloves. There's definitely... Uh, nutmeg, mace, those sort of things happening there. There's a touch of menthol, but not too much. Don't like too much mint. It's just a, a hint of that. But there's dark plummy fruits there as well. Lots of black fruit characters. Um, wood spices. There's a, it's not oaky, but there is, you can tell it's been in barrels. There's that spiciness from the, from the oak there, but usually people use aged or, or seasoned barrels when they're maturing the wine like this. Grenache doesn't react terribly well to new oak. Very lifted. I really find that fascinating. You can sniff that wine for a long time and not get bored. Hmm. Lovely. It's full body, but it's not power. It's not heavy wine. It's it's intense. It's not heavy. It's not of. It's, there's enough tannin to carry the flavour and to make it stand up with food. Plummy, spicy, good balance, harmony, freshness, beautiful drinkability. Although it's going to age well as well. Ninety five out of one hundred we scored it, so it's a gold ribbon score, and it was number one out of twenty five Grenache blends from the Barossa in two thousand and nineteen. So that's a pretty high recommendation. Thirty dollar wine, very very good. We've suggested drink it now until ten years hence, but it will last longer certainly. But that will uh, be the peak drinking period. We asked the winemaker Eleanor Brooks what she would like to serve with it, and she said uh, lamb cutlets with labney and harissa. Sounds pretty good to me. Um, the sweetness of the lamb and the spiciness of the accompaniments. Um, no, it's just gorgeous. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. I think that's excellent uh, advice. So moving on to the Henschke. There's another Grenache blend. Um, slightly different mixture. This is a Grenache Shiraz Mulvedra or Mataro. The Henschke is nearly all Grenache, so it's a different thing altogether. Let me just show you this interesting uh, closure. Uh, this is called a, a Vino Lock, German technology. You take off the little aluminium cap, and underneath is a glass stopper. People, some people are a bit confused about how to open these. The way to open them is just to press gently with your, with your thumb until you hear it pop. And that releases it, up she comes. And it's a very good stopper because it's like a screw cap. It prevents oxidation. It also prevents um, cork taint, obviously, because there's no cork involved. And you can replace it very, very easily, just like that, which is a, a marvellous uh, benefit of the Vinolock stopper. Hinchke Johans Garden, 2018 vintage. This is a perennial favourite of mine. I think it's a splendid wine. It's Henschke, of course, uh, one of the great family companies going back to 1868, um, six, seven generations. They are a great family winery. Um, it's all been said, I'm sure. Um, but let's talk about this wine. It's named Johann's Garden, and there is a, plenty of Johanns in the Henschke family, but they didn't name it after their own family member necessarily. They named it after as a tribute to all of the Johans who were among those early German pioneers of the Barossa Valley, of which there were many. So Johann, very common name, of course, it just means John, I believe, in the English uh, equivalent. And garden, what do they mean by Johann's garden? A garden for the old Germans who were the pioneers of the Barossa meant a vineyard. 
and a lot of them had mixed uh, properties, mixed mixed gardens or mixed um, uh, vegetables, fruit trees, a few pigs, a few chickens, a few vines, a few this, a few that. They had mixed farms, small mixed farms. And usually there was a vineyard as part of it. And if the vineyard turned out to be a really good vineyard, they probably expand, expanded and, and pulled out some of the other stuff. So a garden or a Weingarten, using German, is uh, Barossa for a vineyard. So that's Henschke. Normally they're based in Eden Valley and most of their top wines are from Eden Valley. But this is from the Barossa Valley floor because that's where Grenache does best. And I think probably Mulvedra or Mataro does best as well. What I love about this wine, apart from the way it tastes, is the fact that they've allowed the Grenache to do all the talking. With a lot of GS, GSM blends, as we, we call them, the Shiraz is strong enough to dominate the blend because Shiraz is a powerful dominating variety. And even a small, you know, even 25% Shiraz can be dominant and give you a dark color and lots of power and lots of tannin and dominate the Grenache. Grenache is a lighter variety. But this wine only has 4% Shiraz in it, 77% Grenache. So the Grenache is what's doing the talking. And I really like that about this wine. It's got 19% Mataro too, if, that's, if you're interested in that. Um, all of those things contribute to the wine. But when you look at the colour, it's not as dark as a lot of Shirazes will be. It is medium, deep purple, red, lovely, fresh, youthful colour, that good tinge of purple. And when I sniff it, I smell Grenache more than anything. There's pepper, there's raspberry, there's red cherry, and there's floral overtones, which I'm not sure where the florals come from. Probably the Grenache. Grenache can be very floral, especially when it's picked very ripe. You get this kind of liqueur cherry kind of character. It's really stunning. Um, good Grenache is a beautiful variety. Um, bad Grenache can be green and, and sappy and unpleasant. But this is a beauty. What does it smell? I've told you what it smells like. Let's have a taste. Sometimes these wines can be quite high in alcohol, which can ruin the palate balance, but I don't think this wine is. Beautifully balanced, delicious wine. 14.5% alcohol, which is about normal. Um, Full body, but not a big, powerful wine, not a heavy wine. Lots of tannin, but the tannins are in beautiful balance with the rest of the wine. Um, the line of the wine is lovely. It's, it's got fluency to it. It flows beautifully across the palate. Um, I love the flavours of this wine. It's a beauty. Um, and uh, we scored it 94 out of 100, which is a very high silver ribbon score. It was um, a top ranked wine because it was rated number six out of 36 Grenache blends that we tasted from the Brossa in the 18 vintage. And we said, drink it now until 2033. We actually drink, said, drink it 2022 to 2033. So give it another year if you can. Uh, it's, frankly, it's beautiful now, especially if you have it with food. And um, 12 years cellaring, the minimum, the minimum, that's a conservative estimate. It'll go for a long time. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous wine. We asked Stephen Henschke, who is the chief winemaker, of course, at Henschke, uh, what he would like to serve with it. And he said, our favourite for this wine is smoked maple glazed duck. So I assume what he's talking about there is you glaze the duck with maple syrup and then you smoke it, but I'm not sure. Um, Interesting because a lot of the Barossa is a very big, big on smoked meats, the Barossa. It's that German thing of, you know, you smoke every part of the pig and then you smoke the sausages and you smoke the duck and you smoke the chicken and <laughs> smoked food is very, very popular there. He also said you could have it with any game meat such as quail, venison, rabbit or kangaroo. Well, I have no doubt you're right, Stephen, but I think uh, the maple smoked, maple glazed duck would be my would be my choice and um, wonderful stuff. Thank you. And a couple of questions. Um, John Foster, some time ago, we had a Barossa Montepulciano and we're impressed. Different flavor, but there was some considerable Barossa-ness about it, I thought, not having tried many alternatives. I've often wondered about this Barossa-ness is found in them too. 
totally agree. And I'm going to be talking about Barosinus more in these wines. It's not a term I use, but I might adopt it actually. Thank you, John. Um, these wines, especially Shiraz, they have this kind of ironstone character, which I find is, some people would just call it mineral, but there's something about Barossa wines, I think, that is very specific to the region. Um, we'll talk about that more later. Christopher says, a score of 93 for the Margaret sounds a bit low, given the glowing review. Yeah, um, 93 is a pretty damn good score, I've got to say, Christopher, but I agree that um, that wine, I think, is still a baby. And by the time it's mature, it's probably going to be worth a point or two more. Um, but, you know, the, it's just an indication of how much we enjoyed the wine. And 93 is a, is a pretty strong score. Um, yeah. Seymour Harris says, how many vineyards do Henschke have and in what regions? Well, Henschke, I couldn't count the regions. Uh, I couldn't count the vineyards or the, the hectares uh, right now. I don't have it in my head. But they have vineyards in the Eden Valley, the Barossa Valley, and Adelaide Hills. The Adelaide Hills is the second most important region for them after the Eden Valley. I'm not sure that they actually own any vineyards in the Barossa floor itself. But they certainly buy grapes, as in this wine here from the Barossa floor, but their heartland is the Eden Valley. And of course their Adelaide Hills property is uh, very important, but that's, that's what, that's, that's pretty, that's all they do. They don't do other regions. So moving on to Shiraz. Now we're, now we're talking Shiraz. Hey, this is, this is what the Barossa really hangs its hat on. And the first one we're going to look at is Hayes Family Wines Shiraz 2019. Now Hayes Family is not a family with seven generations, six generations. It's a reasonably newcomer to the Barossa. Um, Brett Hayes is the public face and I assume the main owner of, um, of Hayes Family Wines. And uh, he, um, he's come from nowhere since 2014 when he established the place to produce some pretty amazing wines. And part of the secret of success is that he has a winemaker whose name is Andrew Seppelt, who is a very, very good winemaker. And the name Seppelt should ring a bell because Seppelt family, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the, the original winemaking families of the Barossa. He used to own Seppelt's Field, of course, which they don't own anymore, but they named it Seppelt's Field after themselves, which was fair enough because it was pretty much a village Seppel's field. It wasn't just a winery and a vineyard. It was a village with all of the, you know, butcher shops, baker shops and the rest of it. Um, it is a, it still is a showpiece of the Barossa Valley. But Andrew Seppel is no, no connection with Seppel's field anymore, but he is the winemaker. And I think these wines are particularly good. The, the base vineyard is on Stonewell, in the Stonewell district on Seppel's field road sort of halfway between Tananda and Seppold's Field. Um, the Hayes family bought a vineyard there. It's organic. It's been managed organically for a long time, but they've only recently had it certified. So this wine was made in 19. It was certified from 20 onwards, I believe. Um, not that that really matters. Uh, the culture was the same. Um, this wine is, um, let me tell you a little bit about the Hayes family apart from the fact that it's young and new and everything, they are very into sustainable practices. So not just organic viticulture, but they, they use natural native grasses and they use composting and they're trying to do, improve their soil health. They use rainwater mainly to supply the winery and cellar door. 60% of their energy comes from solar. Um, they are into preserving the natural trees and the natural bushlands and encouraging the species of birds and insects that they used to, um, well, probably still habituate the area. So they're very into that sort of thing, which I applaud very much. Let's taste the wine. Hayes Family Wines Shiraz 2019. They produce quite a, a number of, of Shirazes there. Some of them are single vineyard or single block wines. This is their regular entry level Shiraz, I believe, $35. So it's not expensive, but it's a ripper. Very good color, nice and deep, lots of purple, youthful. 2019, only two years old, it's a baby. And wow, aniseed, chocolate, coffee, mocha, 
blackberry. Blackberry and aniseed are the two strongest flavours in there. It's really a lifted nose. There's a touch of menthol about it, but not much, just a hint. Uh, really lovely nose. And the wine has terrific impact in the mouth. Really very intense right from the word go. Good length, good line, um, lovely sandy tannins which go to all corners of the mouth. It has the flavour and the structure to, to work well as a package. Gorgeous wine. Really, really good. We scored it 95 out of 100 and said drink now to 2033. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think I told you it's, not, it's $35, so it's not expensive. It was number two out of 70 Shirazes from that vintage from the Bross that we tasted and it earned itself a top rank award. We asked the winemaker, Andrew Seppelt, what he would match with it. And he said, grilled barbecued meats, or grilled or barbecued meats, sausages, hearty vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. Put them all on the barbie. In other words, he grills his veggies as well as his meat. And he says, as the wine ages, it will match well with slow cooked meats. Um, I totally agree with that. I think aged wines go with slow cooked uh, meats, you know, braises. Uh, the meat is so well cooked that it falls off the bone and it's really tender. That to me works well. Young, aggressive wines go with younger, with more aggressive flavours like rare char grilled or barbecued meats. Totally agree, Andrew. Now, moving on to another Barossa Shiraz. This is the Heirloom Vineyards. It's got two labels, and it's hard to know which is the front and which is the back, but I'll put the, what, the nice, the pretty label on first. You can see the other one afterwards. All the um, important stuff is written on the other label. This is Heirloom Vineyards Alhambra Shiraz 2019. Don't ask me why it's called Alhambra, but this is another Zar Brooks wine, but this is a different company. Heirloom Vineyards is owned by Zar Brooks and his wife, Eleanor, who... She made the dandelion, but this is a company they own themselves. So um, Heirloom Vineyards, I, I suspect it's called Heirloom Vineyards in recognition of the fact that there's a lot of old vines in places like the Barossa. And this is kind of like a heritage that has been handed down from, from generation to generation, a bit like a family heirloom. Um, it has that sort of, it has that feel about it. So this is probably made from quite old vines. I'm not sure, not telling us very much about the vines. I did find out from Eleanor that the vineyard is in Greenock, which is in the northwest of the Barossa. It's a region that is a subregion which is well known for big, hearty, powerful Shirazes with dark colours which age for a long time. And this has got an impenetrable purple colour. It's an incredible colour. When you swirl it, it uh, almost stains the glass. It's uh, quite an incredible colour. Um, heirloom Vineyards it was only established in 2000, this, this business, so it's quite a young one as well, by Barossa standards. And they also make grapes, make wines from grapes brought in from different regions, such as the Adelaide Hills, Clarenvale, Coonawarra, and so on. Previous vintages of this wine came from the vineyard in the Eden Valley, but the vineyard was sold and they no longer had access to it but they got some fantastic fruit from Greenock for this particular vintage. Tasting the wine. Wow, that smell, gosh. Lots of that dark chocolate mocha character. That is so concentrated and powerful. It's like the color is concentrated, so is the bouquet. It is very impressive indeed. Blackberries, dark chocolate, mocha, coffee, a bit of cinnamon, other spices are in there as well. Mm. Mm. And I was talking before about Barossa Terroir and Ironstone and that sort of thing. There's definitely Ironstone character in this wine, which is very typical of the Greenock area. You've got that... Um, uh, earthy character and also a ferrous type of character. In other words, an iron sort of character. If you smell ironstone, it does have an aroma. Um, and 
that sort of thing that you find in the wine. It's not just simple earthiness. I mean, you could describe it as earthy, but that's not quite enough. It's more than that. That's a, an extraordinary wine of great concentration, great power, really solid. That will last for a long, long time. Oh, that's a 25-year wine, no problem. We said drink it from now until 2036, but I think it'll go a lot longer than that. Um, it was scored 95 out of 100, which is a gold ribbon score. It's a top rank wine again. So it's number eight out of 70 Shirazes from that region and from that year that we tasted. Eight out of 70, pretty good. So um, a powerful, powerful wine. That's, that is classic Barossa. It is such a majestic glass of wine. I think, you know, if I was going to live another 30 years, I would be selling a few pallets of that wine. Mm. Pretty hard not to not to let that one go through to Wally Drought. Uh, we asked um, Eleanor Brooks to nominate a, some food with that, and she said steak and onion soubies. So the onion soubies is a sauce made from onions and Gavin's steak. Gavin, in this sense, is Gavin Sutherland, who is the uh, I think he is their food advisor. He has apparently matched all of their wines with food. And if you look at their website, you might find out more about that. Heirloom Vineyards, there's the back label. And I love this poem. All wine comes in at the mouth and love comes in at the eye. That's all we shall know for truth before we grow old and die. I lift the glass to my mouth. I look at you and sigh. And that's, of course, William Butler Yeats' poem. Beautiful. So... They do all sorts of unexpected things at, uh, at, at um, Heirloom Vineyards. Moving on to the Eisenstone, another Shiraz from the Barossa, this time from the Ebenezer district, which is in the, the north of the Barossa. So it's a little bit further around from Granot, directly north of New York. So Eisenstone is another newish winery uh, it has only been going for a few years. It was established by Stephen Cook, who is also the winemaker, in 2000 and... Da, 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 da. Can I find the date? Can I find the date? It's not there, but it's quite recent. And so it's possibly a name that you haven't heard of before, but Eisenstone is an interesting name. Eisen means iron in German. And that is a reference to the ironstone of the soil that I was talking about. Ironstone is, um, I'm going to take some, oh, sorry, take some questions, wasn't I? But I better do that. Um, I'll finish talking about this uh, Eisenstone thing first. Eisenstone, ironstone. He's deliberately done that German and English and put them together. So it's a bit like um, uh, Mount Edelston in, in, in the Hinchkeys. It's a combination of German and English, which is a nod to the joint sort of um, culture of the Barossa Valley since the early settlers' time. Um, and this is from Ebenezer. But before I do that, I'm supposed to be taking a couple of questions, aren't I? I'll see how I go. We're getting short of time. One quick question here. What is the most unusual food match that you've had with Shiraz that has worked? Ah, that's funny because I'm about to come to that. Probably mildly spicy Indian curry and more of that in a moment because one of these winemakers has recommended an Indian curry. So I better move along, otherwise we'll run out of time. This wine is um, Mr. Cook, Stephen Cook has made single sub-region wines from across the valley, but they're all across the north of the Barossa Valley, interestingly. So he's made a Stonewell, he's made an Ebenezer, He's made um, Sepplesfield, Greenock, Marananga, and Stockwell. So these are all subregions in the north to western part of, of the Barossa. And they're all tiny quantities. And if you look at this wine, the neck label says bottle number 36 of 2000. So there are only 2000 bottles of it, which is, I think, 166 dozen. So there's not a lot to go around. And of course, the problem is there. In the Barossa, it's hard to get your hands on really great fruit these days. There's such a demand for great fruit. 
but he's managed to get his hands on fruit from great vineyards. And this one comes from Adrian Hoffman's vineyard, which is one of the most famous vineyards in the Barossa. How he did that, I'm not sure, but he managed to get a few, a ton or so of grapes from Adrian. And this is a splendid, splendid wine. Let's have a taste. Wow, the color is again, beautifully saturated purple red. And the nose is again, lovely chocolate, dark chocolate, mocha, ironstone, um, coffee, underlying black fruits, blackberries particularly, gorgeous, gorgeous nose, classic Barossa. And like all of these wines, the oak is not dominating. In the old days, people used to make much more oaky wines. I think we've moved away from that, thankfully. Beautiful. And the palate is very full body, powerful wine, penetrating wine. Long, long palate. And last time I tasted this, I was just counting, counting. The, the flavor just persisted for a very long time in the mouth before it started to disappear. There is, a, there is firmness to the tannins, which is typical of Ebenezer. And I think that when you have that with some protein, whether it's cheese or meat, you won't notice the tannins. They just vanish when you have the right, the right kind of food. Protein is the, is the active thing. You've got to have protein with a wine like that. Otherwise, put it in the cellar and let it age for a while and let those tannins soften off. But the tannin is not something to be afraid of. Tannin, good tannins are a very important part of quality red wine. And none of these wines have tannins that are astringent or aggressive in any way. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. So winemakers have become very, very good at getting the right kind of tannins out of their grapes and getting them into the bottle without hardness, without astringency. So excellent nose, excellent palate, lots of concentration, lots of fruit, lots of flavor, multifarious flavors in that wine. You can sit and sniff and taste that wine for a long time and not get bored. We scored at 95 out of 100, which is a gold ribbon score, of course. And you'd expect something good at $75 a bottle. Um, and it is. It's rated number six out of 70 Shirazes from the Barossa in that vintage, 2019. So it's a top rank wine. And we've said, drink it 2022 to 2036. So it's a wine with a serious cellaring potential. Food match, we asked Stephen Cook, and he said, I find full-bodied Barossa Shiraz wines are particularly well-suited to spicy Indian dishes. The spice and mocha of the oak provides a seamless match for spices such as turmeric, cinnamon, and garam masala. Totally agree. I've had many amazing experiences at Indian restaurants with full-bodied fruit-sweet Barossa reds. And it's the, the wine doesn't taste sweet. It doesn't have sugar in it. It's the sweetness, the impression of sweetness that comes from very ripe grapes. That has a firefighting potential, a bit like beer has a good firefighting potential. If you have Vindaloo, for example, I'm not going to recommend Vindaloo with a wine like this, but beer goes well with Vindaloo because it has that firefighting property. So I totally agree, Stephen. I think that's a good recommendation and I'm glad you brought it up. And I'm really thrilled that this is a new and exciting addition to the Barossa wine firmament. Eisenstone, Eisenstein, Eisenstein. Okay, I hate to tip it out, but I have to. So moving along to the final wine of the night, which is a contrast wine. It's not a contrast in style because it's still a full bodied, powerful Barossa Shiraz. But it's a contrast because it's two years older than everything else. It's a 2017. But most interestingly, it's a contrast because it's from the other end of the Barossa. Most of these wines, the Shirazes anyway, are from the northern end of the Barossa. This is from the south. So the southern end of the Barossa, the southernmost town in the Barossa um, is Lindock. And Lindock, uh, that area is slightly cooler and slightly more humid or damp has a slightly higher rainfall than the north. It's closer to the forests, the Mount Crawford forest and all of that area. And all of those things influence the, the weather patterns. So people often mistakenly think that the Southern Barossa is not as good as the north. But when you look at wines such as the Dutch Key wines, he makes um, 
some amazing Shirazes and, and other Reds from, from the south, uh, Wayne Dutchke, and Grant Burgess' Phil Cell vineyard, which produces the Phil Cell single vineyard Shiraz and is usually the backbone, I think, of the Meshack Shiraz, is also in Lindock. This is from Lindock. And it's JDR, I don't know who JDR is, but it is Hemmer Estate, um, JDR Shiraz. Hemmer Estate, I'll have to explain a little bit here. It's only been Hemmer Estate since 2012. Uh, before that, it was called Ross Estate. And it was started by people called Ross who decided to retire and sell the business. It's now under new ownership, um, Hemmer Estate. Hemmer is the... Hmm, Greek goddess, I think, of sunlight, which I think is really appropriate because the Barossa has plenty of sunlight. And uh, this is a really lovely wine. Um, it doesn't have, the, the Lindock area doesn't have the ironstone soils of the north. It has richer, chocolatey, clay loam soils, uh, dark brown to black, uh, blackish soils, more fertile soil. So the viticulture has to be different. The choice of vineyard site has to be different in order to produce wines of, of this kind of concentration, but they have succeeded, possibly partly because of the winemaker who was an ex-Penfolds winemaker called Jason Barrett, um, because this wine has a definite Penfoldy feel about it, I reckon. The color is good and deep. It's got a little more evolution to it than the 2019s we've just tasted, but it's still got lots of purple and it's a very good color. And the nose has so much more of that toasty, smoked oyster, um, barrel fermented, I would say. I, I don't know how he made it, but I would suspect that he finished the fermentation in barrels and that gives you that, what I think Max Schubert and his people used to call the smoked oyster character. It's quite a funky, it's, um, I reckon it's got a lot of umami if you're interested in Japanese concepts like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful nose, but it's very different to the others. And you can see the oak in that a little bit more because they've used 100% new oak in that wine, which is most unusual these days. The others haven't. Um, and it's French and American oak. So I think you can see that. But it's, it's all in balance. It's not overdone. Let's taste it. And that is another ripping wine. A little more evolved, a little softer than the other wines, but still powerful, intense, concentrated, a um, lot of tannin, but they're soft tannins, they're beautifully soft, silky tannins. It has to be really concentrated for it to, to take 100% new oak. And that has done it. That's uh, certainly not too oaky at all for me. It's a beautiful wine. I think that wine um, is going to go on for a long time too. It's um, scored 94 out of 100. It was um, a top-ranked wine. It was uh, number 40 out of 182 Shirazes from the Brossa. So it did pretty well from that year, 2017. And it's $120 a bottle, so it's not cheap. We've said drink it 2023 to 2036. So, yes, you can drink it now but it'll even be even better in a couple of years and then you can drink it for another 10 to 15 years, no problem. We asked the winemaker, Jason Barrett, what he would recommend serving with it. And he said, Moroccan spiced eight hour slow roast shoulder of lamb with onions and freaky. Freaky is a kind of grain, I think. So that would add a bit of crunch to the dish. Um, but yes, slow roasted. I think that's what we were talking about when we were up here. Young, aggressive wines can handle, you know, bleed, a bleeding steak it goes beautifully with them. But this wine is starting to mellow. It's now four years old and it's got a little development to it. And I think that would go so much better with a slow roasted shoulder of lamb. Gorgeous. It would be fine with a steak, I'm sure, but we're, um, we're being finicky here. Thank you, Jason. I think that's a great recommendation and it's a very, very good wine indeed. So a couple of questions before we finish up, or at least one question. Um, Charlotte says, what percentage of alcohol are semions normally? Well, the normal thing with traditional Hunter Valley semion is anywhere between about 10.5 and about 11.5%, 10 
probably 10 at the lowest end and 11 and a half or 12 at the highest end. They can go as high as 12 and a half, but not usually. So they're normally low. Um, and Larry asks, how does Barossa Valley Shiraz and Barossinus differ from Coat Roti Hermitage Shirazes? Oh dear, we need a lot more time to answer that question, I'm afraid, Larry. But um, they all have their specialness and Coat Roti in the Northern Rhone Valley is very different to Hermitage. Coat Roti is on totally different soils. Hermitage is the other side of the Rhone River and it's on granite soils. Coat Roti is on different soils and they give a different flavour to the wines. Um, and, and, and I don't think you can compare Barossa Shiraz to either of those because they're so different. Uh, Barossa is a much more Aussie wine. It's a hotter climate. These are richer, powerful wines of dark colour and, and more generally more muscular than the Northern Rhone wines. Big, powerful wines, although there's an exception to every rule. And I've seen plenty of Northern Rhone wines which have been uh, pretty powerful too. Um, but they're generally a bit more elegant, uh, a bit more subtle, a bit more understated than, than Barossa wines. So this is Barossa. Barossa is, is in your face. Good Barossa is very much in your face. Beautiful. So um, no more questions. It's time. Time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves and had a, a decent glass of something to accompany me. And um, we don't have another um, uh, Zoomcast salad door to door Zoomcast planned at this point, but there will be another one coming up. But the thing to watch out for is um, Friday week, we will be releasing our once a year, our annual top wineries of Australia list. It'll be published in the Good Weekend magazine the following day, which is Saturday week. Um, and we will have exhibitions. And it's a new thing. This year, we're going to have an exhibition of top wines from the top wineries in Sydney and in Melbourne. And uh, more details about that will be coming. Keep your eye on, on the, uh, the newsletter, the magazine, the, the website, the, uh, the emails. We'll, we'll give you all the details about those exciting events that are coming up. I think it's going to be a unique event. We're going to have some of the best wines in Australia and a very small select group of, of, of wineries. It's going to be very, very exciting. So 